please open your Bibles to the book of Luke and chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. And I'll begin reading with verse 11 and read again about the parable of the prodigal son. Our Lord teaching. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. And he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on his journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be in need. And he went and attached himself to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he was longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving him giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I'm dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. Well, what we have here for us this day is the awakening of a sinner. Let me say that a bit differently. We have the awakening of a dead sinner. Very much alive physically. Very much alive to the world. Sin, depravity. But dead to the things of God. What about this awakening? Well, there are four stages. First of all, he began to get hungry. And um, we don't really have any reason to say there was any conviction of sin at this point. Just getting hungry. But at the same time, Something was taking place, I believe, we can conjecture into his thinking. He was beginning to lose this grip on this self-sufficient attitude. Remember, we've been talking about what led up to this, his impatience, his know-it-all, his getting his eyes on pleasure. And I'm my own man. But now there seems to be a little crack in that big facade of what we might call braggadocious attitude. In other words, he is now coming to grips with the reality of the fact that he's not adequate for all the circumstances of life. Now, it's interesting to note that he came to a general sense of his need. What brought him to be aware of it? There were two means that are frequently employed by God to bring someone to what we're going to call the first stage of awakening. 
First of all, he came to this awareness of a general need because he was experiencing the fruit of his own sin. Think of that. It was coming back to haunt him. Look at verse 14. Now when he had spent everything, think of that. When he had spent everything, Notice the next words, the words at the very end of the sentence. He began to be in need. What brought him to that? It was a providential, sovereign intervention of God. It was a famine. No rain. No harvest, no bread. He spent everything. Now, we don't really have any reference here. And keep in mind, this is a parable. This is not an actual, actual historic occurrence. Nonetheless, we have good truth here to absorb. There's no reference as to how long he had been living in that rebellion and sin. There came a point where his sins and their consequences became so intense that he couldn't ignore them any longer. And you know what he began to realize? The truth of the fact you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Sooner or later, it's going to happen. My granddad lived on a, a farm up around Wichita, Vernon, and no, Wichita and Henrietta Bowie, in the, on the edges of a little town called Bellevue. And he planted a garden. And my cousin uh, and I would be at the farm on occasion. And uh, as kids, we wanted to be in the big middle of everything that was going on. And so one day my, my granddad was going to sow some, I guess, uh, green beans or black eyed peas probably. And we wanted to help. But you know how kids are. You kind of get tired after a little bit, you know, the excitement wears off. So my cousin, I didn't know that, that she was doing this, but at the end of every row, what seeds she had left over, she just threw them in the ground and covered them up. Well, you know, in a few days, the sprouts began to come up and very nice in a row down to the end of the row. And at the end of the row, there it was, all of them, big bunch of them sprouting up. Her sins found her out. In a sense, she was reaping what she sowed in quantity. <laughs> no, something's happening in the life of this young man. It's all coming back to haunt him. There's no reference to how long he had been living in this rebellious sin. But there came a point, came this point, that their consequences became so intense that he couldn't avoid them any longer. Up to a certain point, this man really was having a blast. He enjoyed his sins. But there came a time when the money was gone. And so his friends were no longer interested. He was alone and penniless. 
the fruits of his sin were coming home. But there's a second thing. There's a second thing that this record gives us as to what brought him to his general sense of want, and that's, we've already commented on it, but it's God's intervention. And God's intervention came as a famine. The famine had no particular specific connection with this young man's sin. It was God's sovereign providence. God was determined that this young man was not going to get away without knowing that he was totally inadequate for life. That's a hard lesson to learn. But God has ways of teaching. God has ways of getting your attention. God was determined to deal with this young man through providence. But do it so in such a way as to make him realize this hard lesson to learn, I am not adequate for this. You see, God saw that the young man's sins were beginning to bear fruit. That, of course, was still under God's providence. God determined to increase the pressure even more. He runs out of money. He's hungry. And on top of all of that, there's a famine. Things are looking pretty bleak. Now, we uh, commented earlier on that little issue of what we call foxhole conversions, being converted under pressure. There's a couple of ways to illustrate that. One was the sailor that was on the ship that was in the, being tossed to and fro and the storm was blowing and uh, the, everything was going to wreck. And the sailor said, God, if you'll just help me this time, I won't ever bother you again. That's the attitude of a lot of people. They won't help. Now, immediately, and they're willing to almost do anything. The foxhole conversions were during the World War. And digging a foxhole for protection and getting scared and frightened and crying out to God while the bullets are flying over your head. So here's this young man that's in a foxhole situation. Desperate, in other words. You ever hear of John Newton? Who was John Newton? Anybody know who John Newton was? Mm -hmm. Slave trader. Anything else you know about John Newton? What did he write? Amazing Grace. Did you know that he wrote the first hymn we sang this morning? Isn't that interesting? A slave trader. A slave trader. His mom taught him scripture when he was a child. <clears throat> and what's happening when he found himself in these wild 
tempest of storms on this portion. He began to recall what he had been taught as a child and was genuinely converted in his life. This young man began to experience what I'm going to call his general sense of need, his inadequacy, his failure. Perhaps, perhaps he even thought of his moral weaknesses and imperfections. But not sin as sin. The next step in his awakening was he is experiencing all he could put together. Self-help was not going to do the job. Self-help. In other words, he was not yet at the point of sincere and genuine repentance. When I was working as a probation officer, I found that a lot of boys were not sorry they did it. They were just sorry they got caught. And there's a big difference. A big difference. This boy is not yet at the point of genuine repentance. So he's exhausting all self-help measures. He attached himself to one of the citizens. His thinking was probably something like this. I'm, I'm okay. I'll get me a job. I'll work my way out of this. Something's lacking. Seriously lacking. Humiliation over his sins. Hear me well. He's not ready to go home yet. Not ready to go home yet. Now this brings him to the stage of beginning to try to work things out. And I want to say this carefully, but I want to say it. Um, while we desire to see in a given situation true and genuine repentance, I don't want to trash everything this kid did at the moment. He was going to do something. He wasn't thinking about robbing banks. <laughs> i give me a job. So I'm commending him on at least that quality. And it's interesting if we make a right comparison here. There are people who begin to get into this position and um, I, I want to state it this way. They will try anything except that which would humiliate them. And that's where this boy is. I'll get a job. That'll, that'll fix things. He was willing to work. But he's avoiding humiliation, spiritually, 
morally. Now, here comes the third step. And we can be thankful that there was a third step. What is it? He comes to grips with reality. He faces the reality of sin in his life, of wrongdoing. He's no longer looking at, eh, there may be some weaknesses, there may be some uh, inadequate inadequacies. He saw his sin as sin, not a mistake. Not a weakness, not something I inherited. Sin. It's an awakening. I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. Notice the two things that he saw about himself. First of all, he saw that his sins were against his father. Now that's real progress. When God saves a sinner, that sinner comes to grips with the fact that his sin is a personal affront to God. When this young man comes to grips with reality, he no longer sees himself from the viewpoint of, well, I, I lost my friends and I've lost my money and I'm experiencing some social humiliation And I have a few character faults to deal with. And actually some of it's just plain old bad luck. No. He saw that not only what he had done, but that his life was an offense to his father. It's not that I, Dad, I goofed and I made a few mistakes. No, it goes deeper than that. It goes deeper into the very realm of his being as a human being, as a son, that my life is an offense to my father. And when a sinner gets saved, he comes to grips with the reality that that is his standing before God, his creator. It goes beyond the aspects of what I have done or said. It's my very being is an offense to God, my Creator. Look at verse 18. I will get up and go to my Father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and, and, in your sight. Now notice carefully. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Do you begin to see something of the depth of the reality that has gripped his heart? 
Where's that proud young man that took off with his part of the inheritance? See you around. No. I'm no longer worthy. Worthy of what? I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just put me on the list of servants. He was pressed in his conscience with an awareness that the worst part of what he had done was offended his father. In our prison ministry, I deal with men who have committed <coughs> some incredible offenses. Many of them are true believers now. But you know what? In one way or another, what happened is at some point, they dealt with the reality that their sin was not just against humanity, but it was against God, their creator. He realized, that he, this young man realized he just didn't make a mistake. Let me word it this way, dear people. He had chosen to hurt his father. Chosen, think with me, chosen to take his father's wealth and use it to sin against his father. You see the depth and the, of what's going on here? And you think of your own conversion, you think of the men I'm dealing with in prison, you think of the converted sinner, you think of the man, the boy, whoever, that's out there living it up, so to speak. He's taking God's sunshine, God's water, God's favor, God's blessing, benefits, and throwing them right back into the face of God by sinning. Using the very benefits, the blessings that God has bestowed upon you, upon this person, and they take a and use those same benefits to throw it right back in the face of God and say, there you are. The depravity. Incredible. Well, we've all done it. To some degree. What about David? King David. Adultery. Murder, months, months without repentance. And the Lord spoke to David. Twice. Through Nathan the prophet. And what was the message, you have despised me. And eventually, David responds 
Turn with me to Psalm 51. This is his confession. This is his confession. Psalm 51 and verse 4. Against thee, the only, I have sinned. Secondly, in his awakening of uh, this young man, he comes to the place of utter helplessness. There's no longer any help. No remedy. He expresses that by saying, I'm dying here. Desperation. Where is that self-sufficient lad now? The sense of need and inability is absolutely essential if a soul comes to Christ. The sense of need and inability. There are large portions of the Bible that are devoted to the establishing of that truth. That the only way that we can be accepted by God is to come to the point of felt sense of inability to help ourselves. In other words, utter bankruptcy spiritually. <clears throat> Our Lord said, Blessed are. And he said this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit. It is an interesting word that our Lord uses. There are two words in the Greek language that can be translated poor. One word is what we might use to refer to the working poor. That's one word. Another word refers to someone who is what we might call a pauper. And in the time of our Lord here on earth, there were many who were paupers. And that is the word that our Lord uses. Blessed are the paupers in spirit. Blessed are those who are bankrupt, have no help whatsoever. But Christ is not referring to paupers and finances. He's referring to paupers in spirit. This young man had become spiritually destitute. He was broken in his heart because he saw that his sins were an offense against his father and he realized that without his father intervention, he would die. And what happened? He came 
to himself. The awakening. First, general need. Second, the failure of self-help. Thirdly, he saw himself as he really was. And fourthly, he saw his father as his father really was or is. You see, in the verses we've read, there are at least two things that Jesus refers to that the young man saw differently about his father. Are you beginning to see that this is a tremendous and glorious and miraculous awakening? He saw his father's bounty and his father's ability to meet his every need. And that takes place in the sinner's conversion. There's this feeling of utter destitute condition. But at the same time, there is this understanding, this comprehension of who God is and what God can do for me. And when he came to his senses, what does it say? How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread and I'm dying? He's connecting the dots. He saw that his father had food, his father had clothing, but he saw something else and knew it. My father loves me. He could see that. Let me state it this way. Sinners often come to a place of brokenness and such sorrow and one of the greatest things they need is love. Love. And they see that God is love. The sinner always comes to the place that of all the things they need, they don't need justice. They need mercy. And God is merciful. They see God as being full of mercy. Of course, they need forgiveness. But they see that a God of love is ready to forgive. And in a broken state, sinners begin to see that God, what God really is. They begin to see themselves as how they really are. And they see that above all else, they need grace, mercy, and grace. Mercy is getting, not getting the bad you deserve. Grace is getting the good you don't deserve. I mean, in the last couple of minutes, let's imagine a court scene and the defendant is there seated and the it comes in and the judge makes his decision. And the judge says to the young man, fifty years in prison. 
but I'm going to suspend the sentence that's mercy. That's not getting the bad that he deserves. And then the judge says to the young man, by the way, son, as on the way out, stop by the office there, and the secretary has a $5,000 check for you. That's grace. That's getting good. <coughs> that you don't deserve. Mercy and grace. Do you see how those two attributes of God combine together in the saving of the sinner? And there's an awakening that takes place. The light turns on. What if, how does that happen? Well, We'll check that out next time. Because God's intervention is key to the whole situation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence with us today and for your help. And we thank you for the work of grace that you've done in our lives, for the work of mercy and grace that you alone can do. And we pray that you will write these truths upon our hearts. And Lord, give us the joy and the blessing of seeing this take place in the life of many who are yet still outside of Christ. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.